what is this? So before I start, powerlifting is interesting because obviously you need you need a larger amount of stability, trunk stability to do all the movements. So obviously deadlift and squat primarily. So before I start any workout, I do kind of like an activation portion. I take five, 10 minutes and I just do a bunch of like different drills, like a bird dog, dead bug, side plank, or a carry just to um, activate my core, my back. I hate using the word core because it's very, it's generic, but that's essentially it. Do you ever warm up before you deadlift? Yeah. What do you do? I do good mornings and I do bent over rows. And then uh, I watch your videos. <laughs> For motivation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get hyped. Yeah. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> I see you with those new moves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned it from Coach Phil. I don't know if I'm doing them right, but oh, yeah, I'm doing them right. And you can also do this one. You start with isometric holds over here. Really get your lower abs. So all you do is you push up, and you keep your elbows locked in. And you're gonna do a side for the obliques. And just kind of rotate. Five seconds there. Five seconds there, five seconds there. Then you can move into dead bug variation where you hold this one isometrically, pushing really hard against the, the leg, and then alternating five to ten per second. I think the whole point of a warm up is you should be sweating and ready to go before you before you go up to the barbell. I see. Quads are insane. Oh yeah? Oh yeah? That's what I do. Alright, I'm quite small. They're small. So the last two weeks of my training have been pretty uneventful. I came off of prepping for meet after meet after meet after meet. Did four meets from January until what, like June? Um, and thought I was ready to start prepping for the next one, but I wasn't. Just both my body and my mind weren't ready. So the last two weeks, just been taking it easy, you know? Just coming to the gym, doing whatever workout felt good that day. Mm -hmm. So this will actually be my second deadlift workout in the last two weeks. Your second one in the last two weeks? Yeah. This is my second one in my last two days. Damn, you're a better person than me, what can I say? All right. All right, Bart's All right, up. So now I'm gonna get pointers. Tell me what I'm doing wrong or right. He's good. I mean, he has. <laughs> you have really good body proportions for the sumo deadlift. Oh, do I? Yeah, I like. I like how your positions look right now. Although it's really hard for me to judge. It's too light? Yeah, how it's gonna go because I don't know what it's gonna look like when you're actually like going struggling a little, a little bit. Yeah. bit. What I'm looking to see in a sumo deadlift usually when, when someone sets up is and these are just kind of like general rules. Obviously I understand that different people might have different body proportions. Some people might have really short arms, longer femurs, or the opposite, or a short torso, and that's gonna significantly impact the way that people look when they're doing the sumo deadlift especially. Um, but for the most part, what I try to aim for is to see a perpendicular uh, shin, shin or tibia yeah. angle, right? So I want it to be just like perpendicular to the floor like that versus like if you're too narrow, right? It's gonna like start looking like that. Or if you're too wide, it's gonna come angling in. So try to keep it kind of like there straight. Your toes, that's gonna depend on where you feel the most the most comfortable at. There is such thing, there's something that's called length tension relationship of muscles. 
if they're too straight too lengthened they won't be able to exert enough power if they're too shortened they won't be able to exert enough power they're able to exert the most power when they're at mid-range so like the perfect example is for example a bicep curl yeah. the strongest position for your bicep would obviously be right here right oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this would be weak and up here would be also oh, weak so when you're internally or externally rotating your feet you have the external rotators like your performance glute meat that attach over there on your hip that are also going to be impacted by that length tension relation so the more externally rotated the more shortened those muscles are the more internally rotated the more lengthened they are you know so but again it's going to be determined by your uh, your hip structure some people have hips you know the hip has a circle where the where the femur attaches onto. Some people have that circle pointing forward. Some people have that that acetabulum pointing backwards or pointing straight to the sides. And that's gonna be what's gonna impact the most in their starting position. That's why you should never be forcing a position on, on anyone. You teach them the rules. You know, hey, this is how I teach the sumo deadlift. This is what I think it should look like. But I'm gonna work with you to see what positions would work best for you based on your bone structure, on about your body proportions, and on your muscular strength. I look to have your hands right below your shoulders on a straight line. Ideally, you would have one or two fingers on the knurling because that makes it a little bit easier to grip the bar. Girls, especially, that are really narrow, and I guess there's some guys that are really narrow too, uh, are gonna have a harder time with that, but I still encourage them to try to have at least one finger on that knurling because it makes it easier to grip. And that's it for now. Before you pull up, do you, do you kind of like pull yourself into glute tension? Like you yeah. feel glute tension before? Absolutely. For the most part, the sumo deadlift requires a little bit more patience. And like you said, yeah, it's kind of like increasing tension coming from your legs and your glutes. Yeah. To try to generate progressively more power until the bar breaks the ground. A lot of people uh, that are not power lifters might be wondering why you would do a sumo deadlift versus a conventional deadlift. It's not something that you see every day. You don't see a lot of people just doing sumo deadlifts. Like I heard it's sumo is only for people that are constipated. Constipated? Yeah. Well, that might be a reason. Yeah. yeah it helps you with op constipation. Opens it up. Right. The digestive system. That makes sense. Yeah. So if you're constipated, try sumo deadlift. <laughs> uh, other reasons. <laughs> other reasons include uh, there's a lesser there's less dependency on the lower back muscles when you do a sumo deadlift because you can have a more upright torso. So for people you know, that have suffer from low back pain, it's a great alternative uh, when they're having the low back pain episodes to at least be able to work on something. Thank you. 
Because I know most of the heavy pulls are conventional. You, do you train sumo too? I do, not as much. Not as much as conventional, but this was the only way she was going to let me deadlift today, so. <laughs> In terms of weight? Yeah. Um, what I've noticed from the past, so I've competed sumo before, I've competed conventional. Uh, my conventional, my one rep max is always higher, but my work capacity in sumo is much higher. But it doesn't translate, so I think my best on sumo is 495 for 8, and I think I deadlifted 550 sumo. Conventional, I hit 495 for 5 and uh, 495 for 5 and I was able to hit 550 at that time. Okay. But my best conventional is 600. Okay. But it's, um, I don't know, it's just like the work capacity is way higher. I don't know if it's because I'm rushing it and I end up using my back instead of like everything else. That's why I was like kind of paying attention to how you set up and seeing it feels like. Because I think eventually when I get tired, the sumo also kind of turns into a back movement instead of like everything. Yeah, yeah I was noticing that like the difference between one plane and two plane for you. Like yeah. your your chest starts falling forward a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So something I have to have to focus on. That's tough. That's a really tough one to fix. But we can, we can I can try to figure out like why it's happening and what you can do to, okay. what you can do to fix it. You think it has to be a proportions thing, right? No, because when he when he warmed up with a bar and with one plate, he looked perfect. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> but the two plates look ugly. No. Oh, okay. Let's see what three plates look oh, okay. like. Okay. Work on uh, doing a, a pause one inch off the ground. One inch, okay. Yeah, hold it for three seconds. I'll count you up. Like worry about generating tension. Try to stay as upright as you can, and then squeeze your glutes and hold it one inch off the ground. What happens is that your neck position can definitely alter the way that your spine gets organized. Uh, so like if you if you extend your, your neck, your lower back also extends slightly. Yeah. So it just helps you put yourself in different positions. Why should I, I listen to you back. though? Why? Yeah, why? Um, I'm pretty good at that lift. Okay, true. I went to school for a lot of years too. Okay. What are you, a doctor or something? Doctor of some sort. Huh? Doctor of some sort. Yeah, so some sort. Okay, sure. No pros though, she's done. I like this shirt. I think the brown with the red really goes well. Right? Yeah. Start here, they let their chest drop. Oh, that's what I do. Yeah, they let yeah, your chest drop. When you're in this position, it's almost impossible to recover. Like you have to have your shoulders behind the bar. Once I that see. bar I passes see. your your knees, yeah. you better be behind that bar. Otherwise, it's gonna be really hard for you to counteract the weight of the bar. 
Do you practice here? that same mechanic with conventional too, or you kind of? No, exactly. It's like with conventional. With conventional, you're relying on your glutes and lower back yeah. and hamstrings, which are huge muscles for hip extension. Yeah. So it, it almost it's like beneficial for you to. It, it is impossible. Like, how are you gonna start here? Oh, you know? I see. Yeah, 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 In a yeah, conventional, yeah. you have to start over the bar. Uh, I and see. And that like that that moment arm when it's larger. Yeah. From your hips to the bar. Yeah. It almost like it's beneficial. Oh, I see. So it's a little okay. bit different. But in the sumo, yeah, if you're over the bar, once a bar passes your knees, you're done. Got it. He is a freak. He can do both. One time, for in preparing for a what, pro run in Australia, he got hurt two weeks leading into a meet and he couldn't do conventional deadlift but for some reason he could do sumo, he had an inter intercostal strain and those last two weeks he practiced maybe twice sumo deadlift and I don't think you have done any sumo deadlifting like zero in my practice. maybe the entire year and what did you pull that meet? 606 yeah. How much? Sorry? How much? 606 which Wait is up. like no, not anywhere near but it was like I got to practice it for a week yeah, yeah. Like if, if I did that where I did sumo for a year and then tried twice before I meet to do conventional, I'd probably pull like 315 at most. Seriously. I feel like, uh, Maybe 350 at most. I feel like I'm kind of like with my proportions that they're kind of right down the middle. Yeah. So it's like I'm not super, like my proportions don't really favor conventional or sumo. Mm. Kind of Let's do a three second pause again. One inch. I'm going to do three seconds. Ah, oh, shit. I'm trying to do more beltless so I could be more applicable to my fighting stuff. I'm trying to like do less belt. Just like if I'm exerting maximum force, I won't have a belt. Why? That's a classic Steffi look when she's, she's like, she's gonna tell you why she shit. disagrees. Yeah. <laughs> You're the one that wants dead people dying in front of you. <laughs> My so. God, you can't use that against me, dude. That was her card. That's the one he picked. No, you can't do that. How's her technique? Uh, it's pretty good. I mean, I've seen better, so. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good. That pause, have you ever worked with pauses? No, I've never really done pauses, actually. This, my favorite variation for a sumo deadlift are pauses. Just making the, sure the starting position is good, huh? The starting position is everything. The analogy I like to use is a bow and arrow. For example, if you're trying to aim at a target yeah. with a bow and arrow, yeah. you're not going to do this. Yeah, like, yeah, where's yeah. that where's that arrow going to end? Same thing with sumo because it's so skill and technique is so important for the proper execution of this movement that you can't rush it. You need to make sure that you're in the right position at the beginning so that you can complete the lift successfully. So starting position is everything. So I do pauses at the bottom one inch of the floor. And then the other thing I do to work on uh, that initial position are pin deadlifts. Have you ever done those? Uh, it's the one you recently been posting, yeah. right? The isometric ones? Yeah. No, the isometric pulls. Yeah, yeah. Really good for that too. Do you usually do that as like after your main movement? Do you add the afterwards like a, as an accessory? So there's two ways you can use them. You can use them as an accessory yeah. to work on your starting position. Yeah. Or you can use it before uh, you do the isometric pulls first and then you do a light sumo uh, sumo with it afterwards. And you work on like speed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called post-activation potentiation. It basically means that you're exciting your nervous system and as many uh, motor neurons as you can yeah. prior to your workout. And then you put a light, relatively light load, say like 60, 70, 60 to 75 percent on the bar, and you just worry about moving it as fast as possible. So initially, you work on the pins, to work on your positions, and to work on motor unit recruitment. You know, making sure that your nervous system is excited and you can access as many uh, muscle fibers as you can. 
and then you transition into doing speed pulls to like apply it essentially. So like a lot of uh, oh. explosive athletes use similar techniques. Yeah. You know, people who need to like sprint fast or jump high use that technique where they would squat or do a jump squat with weight and then they would go into right after they do uh, say like broad jumps or, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or box jumps. Kind of like the French contrast training. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's called BAP, post activation potentiation. So should I go up? If it, should I do a go up and not pause it? Or should I pause no. it and stay there? What do you think? Pause it and stay there. Work on your technique. Some people think technique's overrated. What do you think about that? Technique is the most important. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here first. She thinks technique's important. Chest up, look forward. So the goal is to keep the shoulder over the bar the whole time? In line, like in line. never over. Either in line or slightly behind. In the sumo deadlift. Like I said, in conventional deadlift is different. Conventional deadlift, you want to be over the bar. Same as like a clean or a snatch, you always want to be over the bar. But like in any barbell movement, always the goal is to move your body around the bar and not the other way around. So the bar should stay where it's at and move in a straight line. Oh, so you need to manipulate your body, put it however you if you're going to be out there, then that's where they need to go. Like, because the bar needs to be able to clear in a straight line from initial position to ending position. Same thing for a snatch. If you're here, what do you have to do with your le with your knees in order for that bar to travel straight? Move it out of the way. You move them out of the way like that, right? Same for like if you're in a clean, it starts here, yeah. and then you move them all out of the way like that. But the bar always travels in a straight line. What do you what do you what do you say to like someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger who says a proper curl of the bar should go in a C? Well, a, a curl is different than a than a deadlift, a snatch, a clean and dirt because yeah. deadlift, uh, bar, uh, bicep curl is used for hypertrophy, right? Like you're not necessarily trying to make it You're trying to make it as efficient as possible. Yeah. Because that's that's how muscles grow. You hear that, Arnold? You're done. <laughs> that's because m muscles grow. You increase. The load, the time that you spend under tension, and, their, and the distance. That's, those are like three mechanisms yeah, of, hyper, yeah. of hypertrophy. Whereas like in strength training, you're trying to shorten the distance as much as possible. That's why some people say sumo is easier. Obviously, the, the distance of the tra bar travels is shorter than in a conventional deadlift. But not because of that reason, it makes it easier. Obviously, yeah. body proportions play a huge role. Yeah. You can have someone with like really short arms and a really long torso that literally needs to go like this to reach the barbell. That's probably not going to be the best variation for them. Even though it's going to be a shorter range of motion. Yeah. If you're using this kind of straps, you want to make sure that this part, the strap is facing inward. So it's going from out to in. That's the proper way to use them. You see how they're both pointing inwards? Like that. So stepping. Is there anything that he has to work on? 
that, what he's doing now is just the starting position, making sure that when the bar leaves the ground, he's looking forward, his chest is up, and you just don't let it collapse the rest. Look awesome. Some people look straight up. What do you think about that? Is that bad? No, it's not. It's not bad? Whatever works for them. I mean, I would, I would advise against like a, any sort of uh, end range, putting your, your joints in end ranges of motion. So like if you're really hyperextending oh. your neck, or like really hyperextending your back, probably not the best in the long term. Although yeah. we don't have any sort of scientific proof that that actually happens. Just my common sense says, hey, probably not the best idea to load a joint and take it to end range. To its limit, so it's like my same argument with a round back deadlift, even though there's no solid proof or no direct relation between rounding your back and deadlift and an injury. Yeah. Even though common, like, popular belief is, hey, you shouldn't be picking up, picking stuff up with a round back. Probably it's not a big deal if you do it without load, if you're just like picking stuff up on the floor, especially if you've been exposing yourself to that movement for years. Yeah. My common sense tells me, hey, probably not the best idea to round your back as much as you can and put 500 pounds of back. First time maxing out, not to a metallic song. It feels weird. Every single one of my PRs has been done to a metallic song. felt good so you're like let's see what happens yeah so usually like when I'm warming up I can identify whether it's gonna be a high power output day where I'll be able to go for a really high weight or low rep or I don't have enough power like I don't feel it in me to like pull something heavy but I know I can go for more reps yeah. I can identify based on the warm-up like those five reps I did before the set at 405, felt pretty easy. I don't think I could have gone heavier than this, not even for one. Probably for 10 and like miss it. But I had like the high kind of like high endurance day. So I can do this for like squats and deadlifts. So I'm at a point in my, in my training where following a plan is really difficult. Because, no, not necessarily, just like how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis fluctuates so much, it's crazy. Like, I tried, so Dan Green was writing my program for a while. Yeah. So out of breath, is embarrassing. The 10 reps. Yeah, the 10 reps. Yeah. I can't believe it. That's what I'd be. I'd be asleep. So when Dan Green was writing my program, yeah. he would have like specific weights for me to hit. This was the beginning of 2018. And nothing impossible, you know, say so at that time my best was around 500. He would write say triples at 440, 420. I would come to the gym and literally not be able to do three good things. So it was frustrating. So I can't do anything that's too precise, like with percentages or set weights, because for some reason, 
how I feel varies so much. And the more I wait, the more I increase in weight, the more variation I have from session to session. How hard is that, like, uh, competing then? Because you need to hit the highest number on that day. Like, how do you kind of, like, manage that for a, a meet? I'm, I'm a performer, so I always feel like when I have a crowd in front of me, it's like, no matter how I feel, I'm gonna do well. And so far, at least, it's been the case where I've been able to improve my marks every competition. Yeah. But uh, it affects me more, like, on the day to day and training. Yeah. Brutal. Literally, like, I think last week or 10 days ago, when I tried to deadlift, I left the gym after attempting 160 kilos. So that's 45 kilos less than this. Almost 100 pounds. Like I couldn't do it. It wouldn't budge. Did you do a single? I wouldn't budge. I left the gym. I went to my house walking. It was like, you check okay. to see if there's glue under the weight or not. But sometimes Satan, people, some Satan people leave was it probably there. pulling the weight down to hell. It's like, no! <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, it's great. Especially if you're competing, you gotta think about that. I mean, it's not about just showing up to the gym and doing something heavy that day and then and then what? You have to think about the big plan, you know, how is that session gonna impact your, your future training sessions and is it gonna pull you back or push you forward? That's what you have to ask yourself mm -hmm. if it's worth it in that day. Sumo Delph was awesome with Steffi because she's such a master at it. And I've done it before and I kinda trained myself, but I think understanding the proper cues and like just like little fine tuning things, it, it really helps out. I think I was able to get myself to my sumo deadlift maybe 80, 85% of the weight. And I think just the like, you know, making sure I keep my head up or that even like the pause that you recommended, staying an inch off the floor, I can really feel, oh, that is the most powerful position. I'm engaging my glutes way more, which is something I constantly forget to do is engage my glutes. So I think that really helped out. And since I'm starting to implement speed pulls now in my near training, um, I think I can really focus Implementing all the cues you told me. Yeah. yeah. And start doing your, try doing the pin, the pin pulls. Pin pulls? Before the speeds. So did you see a progression um, from the first time he lifted to the last time he lifted? Like, was he taking um, your instructions pretty good? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, answer for you, I, I killed it. I think you should try to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's really what separates a good lifter from a great lifter is their ability to listen, observe, uh, and, and then implement the cues and the corrections that you're you're being given. So yeah. you were really good at that. I actually just called you a great lifter. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he was pretty good. Thank you. So like 10 minutes before you arrived, Bart was like bragging to us about how he's going to just go beltless and that's how he's going to improve his training. Uh, what, what can you say to that? And is that like a good cue for him to have? So well, I asked him why he was thinking about lifting without a belt and he said that he wanted the strength that he's using in the barbell movements to translate into his primary sport, which is, what do you do, Taekwondo? Uh, uh, Muay Thai. Muay Thai? Yeah. Okay, into his Muay Thai. And my answer to that was, I mean, and we briefly alluded to that in the, in the video, is that the adaptations that you get from strength training can apply to sports generally. So whether or not you're using a belt, it's not necessarily gonna translate less or more to whatever sport you're doing, because if you're trying to get better at rotational explosiveness, for example, that's, uh, that's a particular skill that you can develop in that specific sport. So it doesn't matter whether or not you're lifting with a belt, um, it's a general adaptation that you'll be able to use in your, in your other sports independently of whether or not you use a belt. So if you're trying to get stronger in a sumo deadlift, and the belt allows you to lift more weight, then I would advise you to use the belt. Sounds like a lot of bro science, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think when you're, when you're taking, Did it make sense? Yeah, and I think it, sometimes it's hard to see when you're talking about like more niche sports, 
if you think about things like, uh, like football or hockey or whatever, you know, if you look at a football player, they're in the weight room to get strong. Yeah. They're not like strapping weights to their whole body and then playing football to get stronger, right? You yeah. get stronger in the gym and then you refine the skill of, you know, agility, speed, all those things on the field. Yeah. And that's how you make the strength that you built in the gym translate over to what you're actually doing in the sport. The same thing applies for, for fighting, for Muay Thai or anything like that. I see. It's, it's just harder like, to It's kind of like the way, wherever you're training, you have to train accordingly in that like arena. So if you're working on flexibility, you wouldn't do yoga with a football helmet on because you're gonna be wearing a football <laughs> helmet, right? Like you try to do yoga the way yoga's right. done, exactly. strength training the way strength training is done, and then on the field agility the way it's done. Exactly. That makes sense. Bro science. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that Steffi and Hayden stopped by because they fixed my sumo, and uh, she's super strong. What's the? What are we looking forward to for your next meet? Uh, so I'm competing in about seven weeks. Um, I'm looking to actually drop one weight class potentially for that uh, for that competition, and hopefully maintain my strength from the previous meet. So in my last meet, yeah. I was able to do a 507 squat, uh, 240 bench. 240 did I do? 242. 242 bench and a 530 deadlift. So if I can hit those same exact numbers in a weight class lower, that would be. What weight class is that? Good. It's uh, the 114. Okay. So I would actually bump my wheels to about 730. What's the best all-time wheels? 720. So like that would be really good if I can do that. Dang. You're closing. You're dropping secrets. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm super forward. Uh, looking forward to that. And thank you guys for all who's supporting our content. Don't forget to support the brand, barbergate.com. Link in the description below. See you guys next time. Peace.